is this a new beginning or a new direction or is it perhaps the fruition of something planted and established long ago finally ripening we will see we will together discover which of those seeds will sprout and what in our forest, orchard, garden survives the harsh winters of the mind. It is written, there's one who scatters and more is added, while one who refrains from what is proper is only for a loss. A benevolent soul will grow fat, and one who sates others will himself be sated. One who withholds produce, the nation will curse him, but blessing will be upon the head of a provider. One who seeks good for others seeks the Creator's favor, but he who searches out evil for others, it will come upon him. He who trusts in wealth he will fall, but the righteous will sprout like foliage. One who troubles his household will inherit wind. A fool will become a servant of the wise of heart. The fruit of the righteous one is a tree of life, and a wise man acquires souls. What does it mean to acquire souls? Well, the intelligent thing, or the thing you would hope from a publisher of such strange and arcane axioms or philosophy or even literature which might not be so open to interpretation is that we get some sort of interpretation or opinion um, and hopefully that that has some sort of historical grounding isn't just the opinion of the editor alone and here it says the fruit of a righteous one is the tree of life. The reward for deeds of the righteous is a tree of life for the world. The deeds of, a right, of the righteous are like a tree that brings life into the world. Something beneficial grows from his every deed, giving life to his surroundings. That's Rashi, Metsudos, and Ar Hirsch. Those are three separate but similar uh, conclusions on that passage. And the wise man acquires souls, Rashi once again explains, that by teaching people the proper way to live, a wise man acquires them. As it says of Abraham and Sarah, the people, literally the souls, they had acquired in Haran. Bereshit 12.5 And this goes on. For example, the Midrash applies the verse to Noah. What is the fruit of a righteous man? His mitzvot. And good deeds, as the verse states, these are the offsprings of Noah. Noah was a righteous man. The offspring mentioned in this verse are not his children, but his good deeds. The wise man's acquire souls refers to Noah, for he fed and sustained all the creatures in the ark for a full 12 months. Each creature in the ark had to be fed, fed at a specific time. Hence, Noah was praised as a wise man for knowing the correct time to feed. And it goes on. I've read only half of the interpretations, but as you can see, the uh, Art Scroll Mishle compiles quite a lot of information. And moving on to a completely different topic, we have collected works of um, on literature, the analysis of literature. We have Aristotle's On the Sublime, Longinus, or sorry, Longinus is on the sublime, Aristotle's Poetics, and Demetritus on style. And we see here, this is the last page I studied, um, that there are footnotes. So, for example, it says, But from wandering through villages, when banned from the city, and they say their own word for acting is drawn. What does drawn mean? Well, it says, see the other footnote. Um, here it says, For it is an instinct of human beings from childhood to engage in mimesis, 
footnote says here, a genus of activities including imitated behavior and artistic image making as two of its species. So mimesis could be anything from the monkey see, monkey do of children to the artist referencing perhaps other art or perhaps reality to make their art. Leonardo da Vinci was known to take walks in public and grab a gesture, a hand, a facial feature, maybe just the nose or maybe just the jaw, and then later combine them into his grand paintings. So this could be considered mimesis, a um, form of Im imitative learning. You can see that the footnotes in my uh, Loeb Classic Library edition are much, much shorter. Um, for example, in the Art Scroll, I only read maybe a third or half of what was there on that one passage. Whereas here you have barely a sentence on a single word. So that sort of brings us to what is this new project, this new, what will become a YouTube channel about? The goal will be to explore the deeper side of intellectual pursuit. You see, there is a certain tendency to teach, especially undergrad students, just the broad basics of their art, their discipline. So for example, I have a bachelor's degree in English literature. Most of my courses were survey courses where you would cover about two or three centuries, or if you were lucky, just one century um, in a course. Which means that every week you're covering one to two writers. And even that is, um, you know, sometimes you'd cover a topic and there'd be three or four writers. And you get a good sense of what's going on. You get a lot of background and history. And these are all vital. If they didn't have that, you might as well just pick up a book yourself. Or even better, head over to LibriVox. Where, um, for those of us who are uh, lacking in attention span, we can, like those who listen to podcasts for hours, download literature, great works in the public domain from LibriVox.org and listen to them instead of, or as well as, said podcasts. I don't, by the way, subscribe to the idea that modern man has a shorter attention span because um, we happen to be the ones who marathon entire Netflix series and listen to three-hour Joe Rogan interviews. Uh, meanwhile, the generation before us watched 20-minute television interviews and sound bites from news. So, you know, we were spoiled, or my parents' generation was spoiled, if they were able to see a 60 minutes interview, a, a full hour long talk, or perhaps a documentary. So, I, I gave the two poles, as a good philosopher should, the two extremes of what we might study. We went from literally the works of King Solomon, Mishlei's Proverbs, to um, another great genius, Aristotle. Now, the reason why I can say genius about Aristotle and not necessarily great man about Aristotle is because actually Aristotle, despite writing um, more than one work on ethics, and the, it's actually compiled, the Nicomachean Ethics are compiled from lecture notes. Uh, he didn't write an official book for a publication, but it was compiled later. 
after his death into a book. That means he was teaching people directly these ethics. But at the same time, he had one child, as far as I know, and it was not with his wife. It was with, um, I think, a servant girl or something of this nature. Essentially, his one offspring, his one uh, biological legacy was illegitimate. It was adulterous, you could say, uh, in some sense. There are some finicky definitions of the word adultery. Solomon, too, actually um, had a little bit too many wives, and it ended up being disastrous for his nation. But regardless, these are the sorts of um, people we will study. We have Aristotle. I sort of grabbed a pile of books that we might cover or that symbolize these sorts of things we might cover. So here's a very tiny little volume called A Defense of Poetry or A Defense of Poesy by Philip Sidney. This was written, I would say, shortly before the time of Shakespeare. Uh, 15, we're talking late 1500s. And as far as I can tell, Poetry was considered, I believe by Plato, to be lies. It's, it's not true. It's not biography. It's not history. And therefore, it's false. And therefore, it's lies. And therefore, it's bad. And th based off of that, of course, the great poet of the time needed to defend it. This is a very short volume. It was covered in one of my first year courses. And um, there are some fascinating arguments of it that are useful even for us who do not believe that poetry is lies. Um, I won't be reading an excerpt from it because I don't have one prepared. That's going to be another hallmark of this channel is that I won't talk about anything that I haven't prepared or at least thought about on a deep level. If I want to do that sort of video, I will keep it um, on my personal channel, which this will, this video will be uploaded on until I make the more official uh, scholarly channel. And that's where all my vlogs are. So I'll, I'll talk more about why I'm making the transition from vlog to um, scholarly or educational video later the the last scholarly the last um literary uh figure that i will be talking about for sure is northrop fry this is his anatomy of criticism and it's actually controversial in the literary community because it posits ideas which makes scholars uncomfortable because it sort of doesn't decide but rather discovers the underlying rule of all narratives and the idea that there is underlying rules for all narratives um goes against the you could say modern or especially postmodern notion that um things are sort of untethered and unfixed and we must decide the meaning fry says no actually um there are only four genres uh he what he calls myths uh there's those that end in with a good ending for the community those that end with a good ending for the protagonist those that end with a bad ending for either the community or the protagonist but always the protagonist and finally anything in between so good good in between, bad. There are no other options, right? You can't have a, you can't have any other ending than a good ending, a bad ending, or an in between ending. You might say, oh, maybe there's no narrative arc and it's just flat. Well, that that falls under irony, the in between myth. There are also five levels of characters uh, going from the mythical hero who uh, maybe is immortal, all the way down to the sort of 
um, weak or unprivileged hero usually found in um, comedies because uh, we sort of laugh at their folly. Um, no offense, but something like Mr. Bean might come to mind. Uh, so, and, and they often correlate with these genres. So the, the slightly better or much better, but not quite immortal of the protagonists would usually pop up in tragedies because tragedy is typically about somebody who's so great but goes the wrong way and ends up suffering for it, usually through death, but sometimes through madness or exile. That is Northrop Fry's Anatomy of Criticism for Essays. And you actually typically do not touch, or if you touch it, you don't get very deep into it until uh, graduate level. So um, a lot of what I teach will be based off of the points in my university career where we did touch it, touch on it, where we talked about the four myths. Um, I personally studied the five tiers of characters um, from this book, and we might also talk about the, the image networks. Um, there are certain degrees of uh, natures and creation. So there's the mineral, the vegetative, the animal, and the human. Right, and these uh, Northrop Fry talks about it a lot because he analyzes all of the great literature in order to discover, like I said, not invent but discover his theories. And this four level view of the world is very classical. A lot of medieval Greek uh, monks, usually uh, Christian monks. We're talking about this and sort of uh, they had discovered it in the Bible. So it's a very, very old idea, perhaps as old as the four elements. And perhaps it lines up with the four elements. Um, you know, earth is mineral. Water makes plants. Um, maybe not. Uh, we're left with what? Fire and air. I don't know how air's, air or fire has to do with... Uh, air could work with humans because humans speak. Um, regardless. We will also get into sort of the parts of history that people don't want to talk about. Um, like intellectual history, obviously. Like how Isaac Newton was a bit of a mystic uh, who studied alchemy the, and was a great theologian. The religious worlds of Isaac Newton, priest of nature. An enormous contribution to the Newtonian lit literature and history of science in general. It examines a huge number of sources that were now and until now essentially unknown and provides unparalleled contextualization of the man and his work from science magazine. The Wall Street Journal says, while other biographies acknowledge that Newton possessed a sincere, though heterodox faith, McEffie, the author, serves up the most complicated picture to date of the, he, the faith itself. He completely recasts the relationship of Newton's scientific inquiry to his religious beliefs, tying the two together in, to an unparalleled degree. Attention to such detail woven deftly into a finely constructed and well-written narrative makes McCaffrey's priest of nature a robust portrait with broad appeal in shattering the simplistic enlightenment account of newton the book reveals the flexibility of the great man's capacious mind and that's the wall street journal i have not read this if i do talk about this it'll be months from now because well the type is tiny so there's a lot to read here it's 450 pages and there's like 50 of those pages whoa 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 from page 400 and four yeah over 100 pages is notes or uh citations like bibliography then um i will not be delving too deep into things like scripture. I just think Proverbs is fascinating 
as a general rule, the idea that um, people who take and take and take uh, will not be uh, uh, very much liked by their society. And those who give and give and give will not only be liked, but actually they will themselves acquire wealth. And probably because if you think in a business sense, right, just put aside all the politics of capitalism and things like that, and just think about two businessmen who trade goods to go sell to customers. If somebody is very generous on his side, let's say they work in separate cities and one sells, one has an inventory of fish and the other has an inventory of bread, and then they meet and one says, I'll, get, I'll trade you two fish for two loaves of bread. And this says, sure. Or I'll trade you three fish for two loaves of bread. And he says, that's fine. We'll go two for two or one for two. I'm generous. The next day, if they meet in the market, the B2B market, the business to business market, the person who got a good deal for his bread will go find that fish guy from yesterday rather than finding a new fish guy. But if the fish guy was greedy, if he said, yeah, actually, I want four loaves of bread for two pieces of fish, the bread guy might make the trade that day, but the next day he's going to want to find somebody who will do a one-for-one -one trade. That's a very good, very clear, concrete example of um, perhaps silly with fish and bread, but of trade and of course this happens to this day um, if you go to a restaurant right and think of a home style mom and pop restaurant and you get a burger and fries often you're going to get a huge plate of fries but if a new restaurant opens up and it's the same price same quality but you get a normal serving of fries you don't have anything bad against that new business but you're more likely to go to the older business of the same nature because they are more generous it's not just about how much fries you get it's about this this idea of generosity then we'll edge into um so we won't talk so much about uh directly about scripture um i believe there's enough channels doing that already and much more qualified people um perhaps clergy who actually study it uh, for their living. Like, uh, well, whatever cleric of choice you would want to go to, depending on your denomination and faith. But we will talk about other things like ethical philosophy. I talked about Nicomachean Ethics by Aristotle, which is right there on my shelf. Um, but also... Things like the seven gates of righteous knowledge. Um, so, will there be, you probably noticed a little bit, that uh, there's a sort of religious bent to some of my presentation. And that's going to be a feature and not a defect for me. See, there are probably hundreds of YouTube channels that will give you clean secular objective scholarship and I figure I be like them and provide exactly what they provide when instead I can provide something similar albeit to the level of my education which is only a bachelor in arts but um, taking into account what all of the greatest um, founders of science took into account Francis Bacon said, a little bit of science or philosophy brings a man to atheism, but a great deal of philosophy brings a man back to God, implying that atheists are not very deep in their philosophy or science. I don't know if he meant that, but uh, Bacon could be a little bit, of, a bit scathing. He was, uh, I believe he is something of a, a courtier, a politician. Isaac Newton had quite a lot to say, as we saw. His religion was intertwined with his science. Um, he developed mathematical principles and geometric principles from the detailed measurements of the 
uh, third holy temple in the book of, uh, it's either Jeremiah or Ezekiel. So, no, this is not a religious channel. Um, it will be a scholarly channel, but um, we won't we won't push faith or anything like that. But if it does come up, if we're studying Newton and he starts talking about um, issues he found with the Greek versions of Scripture versus the Latin and English translations of Scripture, um, we he might just dive head first into that if it's part of my plan uh, for that episode. So I don't want it to catch anyone off guard. I'm not, uh, what is it? Uh, Jesus smuggling was a term I heard once where um, they kind of, this is style of, of sort of dancing around the subject, but really they want to talk about this thing and maybe convert you. None of that's going to happen here, uh, except by accident, I guess. Um, but fairly openly, this is the second gate, Seven Gates of Righteous Knowledge by Rabbi Moshe Weiner and Dr. Michael Shulman. The fact that we have a rabbi and a doctor, I'm not sure what his PhD is in. Um, collaborating is sort of the uh, sort of the approach that I want this channel to take. Um, but obviously more focusing on the doctor side of things. So uh, just briefly, the seven gates of righteous knowledge that it talks about are according to the table of contents, and you can see it on the back of the book here. The first gate is the knowledge of God. The second gate is the prophecy from God. The third gate is the gate of service. The fourth gate is the gate of prayer, um, which is a self-development and discovery meditation. It said, obviously, one cannot change God's mind. So what does prayer do? It changes your mind to be more in line with reality rather than what you wish reality was. This is not my opinion. This is a fairly orthodox opinion of prayer, uh, though perhaps maybe not very Christian. Or perhaps it is. I'm not quite sure. The gate of personal traits desired by God. The sixth gate is the gate of being tested. Um, and suffering and things like this. The seventh gate is of repentance. And this is a very small volume. Uh, I have not read it, but uh, it is what I have sampled from it is fascinating. Again, this is just a um, an example of the sorts of things I want to address on this channel. In line with that are um, sort of classical uh, works on ethics and conduct, like the Chovetz Chaim's, um, or sorry, the Chovetz Chaim, <laughs> that's the name of it. It means desire of life. This is a tract on uh, speech, proper speech. It's pretty much the religious equivalent to uh, rhetoric, which again, I have a giant rhetoric textbook there, which you cannot see because it's blurred. Um, but likely we will delve into rhetoric because rhetoric was one of the things I would have taken many courses of, but actually there were only one, there's only one rhetoric course, which used this as its textbook. So I've actually read about a third of this, like literally I've read hundreds of pages out of this, uh, 1600, so that's 1,600 page um, textbook. Uh, so, you know, speech, the way to speak, the proper way to speak. Rhetoric is, uh, nowadays it's used as like somebody's rhetoric. It's used as like a slur. It's like somebody, you know, talk, sweet talking or, or has some sort of sense of falsehood. But the way that Aristotle, for example, characterized rhetoric was that it was the way to communicate 
true or important ideas to many people in a convincing way. Um, he said, while logic or philosophy dealt with things that must be so, rhetoric dealt with things that might be otherwise. So rhetoric is the way to speak about things we are not certain of right now. Um, I believe it was either Cicero or Quintilian who said that rhetoric is a good man speaking well. And so here, once again, we have ethics being brought in to the subject. And that works very well. This sort of rhetoric of a good man speaking well works very well with Chavetz Chaim, which is about essentially um, how dangerous it is on a spiritual level to slander and speak badly about other people. Um, how to guard one's tongue from slander and other evil. Um, it has been studied for over 100 years by scholars and laymen alike. Uh, there's some very interesting stuff about the heavenly courts. I don't know if it's in here, but it, the, the teacher from which I online learned about the principles of Lashon Hara um, went very deeply into the the workings of the, the heavenly court and how um, basically there are angel lawyers up there and when you speak bad about people down here you give them the the right to speak badly about you up there but if you don't then the accusing lawyer, the enemy lawyer against you in the heavenly courts has to sort of shut up because it's sort of connected. It's measure for measure. And so by not speaking poorly about other people, they can't speak poorly about you upstairs. And that means that even if you've done things that re require punishment, it can't be processed in the court and it just kind of gets frozen. It's very interesting, and obviously when it's frozen, you can, according to this religion, of course, uh, Judaism, you can atone for it before you can be punished for it. That's uh, repentance, of course. The final thing, perhaps the most exciting thing, and I left it for the end because I don't want my channel to be known for it. Um, there are much, much more qualified people putting content on YouTube on this topic, but not a lot of it is accessible and not a lot of it is search engine optimized which means that people who are searching for these concepts um, will find non-scholarly non-studied um, non-rabbinic sources for these important scholarly technical um, perhaps even dangerous if learned incorrectly subjects. The way that it was explained to me was kind of like if you open up a uh, fourth year medical surgery textbook and started using it to do surgery on somebody, it's like y you cannot just walk into a hospital, grab a scalpel and start cutting if you don't work there and aren't trained. And so some of this knowledge is so technical and specific that if you don't know what you're doing, you can get it wrong and it'll cause some trouble. And we are, of course, talking about Kabbalah. This is a book, Kabbalah and Meditation for the Nations, which is directed specifically to non-Jewish people like you and I. Um, it's written by uh, Rabbi Yitzhak Ginsburg, who is this kind of, you know, he looks like a wise old sage. I, I kind of um, appreciate that. And um, it's targeted to everyone. So there we go. I focused. That's cool. So if um, so we will cover basic stuff from here, the, the sorts of things that um, were covered by um, credible sources who were of a lower level of education. So we might talk about 
and we'll most likely talk about things like the sephirot sephirotic tree, which you can see sort of faded on the cover here. Let's focus that. Um, there are, and I know I'm blurry, just give me a moment. There you go. Everybody knows this. <laughs> Not everybody, but it has become sort of a popularized symbol. Um, and maybe I'll clear up some misconceptions to the best of my knowledge. And when I talk about certain more nitpicky things, like I said, Cabal is kind of like, not the basic. Once you go beyond the Sephirot into the weirder stuff, like the parts of theme or the, the four upper worlds, or the fact that each of the upper worlds are divided into seven parts, and um, the, the planets live in the, the, in the sky are technically part of a higher level of our world called Rakia or Rakia. Um, once we get into those sorts of level of stuff, I probably will just perhaps make an overview and then point you to somebody who can explain it more accurately. Somebody who's more at the doctor level to continue our analogy, like Rabbi Yitzhak Ginsburg or some other, something people don't understand is that, uh, Kabbalah is really, really 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 jewish um it was appropriated in the last hundred or 200 years by newer religions like well i won't name them because maybe their adherents might get unhappy with me but we're talking occult religions esoteric religions who found this kabbalah stuff fascinating and so they sort of took it and threw using it for their own methods, sort of twisted it. And so you go from proper, clean surgery to, you know, more like witch doctor stuff. And they don't even know that there's stuff beyond the Sephiro, like parts of theme, and that things start working differently once you uh, start using Keter instead of Dot, or that there are... Um, there's linear sephirot and spherical sephirot, and that they work inversely. Um, I, I've even seen somebody try to attach the tail of the tree, which is Malkut down here, into Dot, which is like putting your feet, the tail here, your feet, into somebody else's mouth, which is very stupid. Um, and like if you don't understand what these mean you might have ideas like that but it doesn't go into dot it goes into keter of the next um uh the next level down so um or, or the fact that each of these 10 little spheres sphere out has 10 spheres inside them it's very fractal like so that that's the the final topic so let's go back through it in reverse order kabbalah specifically the the less complex stuff the stuff where maybe i can clear up misconceptions and i will be doing a lot a lot of citing from sources i'll be reading perhaps more than half of the video will be somebody else's somebody more qualified's words because like i said it's like surgery you don't want to turn your doctoring into witch doctoring um you don't want to turn your prophecy into sh shamanic visions you don't want to turn your visions into a the equivalent of a drug trip then we'll have ethical speech both religious and non-religious i'm actually really fascinated by um rhetoric you know, pathos, ethos, logo, pathos, ethos, logos. That is the emotional appeal, the ethical or appeal to authority, and the logical appeal. Um, very fascinating. Um, hashkafa, so so perspectives and um, pers uh, on on proper conduct. Um, conduct that's a good one 
Uh, and, and we will probably look into conduct books from the 1800s, like uh, Halifax, which is completely not, I think it's not religious. Halifax, he wrote to his daughter, but actually the book was used by all sorts of parents to basically oppress the women. So we won't be taking him seriously, but we will be seeing what uh, uh, women of that era had to deal with. Um, perhaps we'll briefly touch on, on scripture, but again, um, like Kabbalah, I will not be deviating very much from the text and, uh, perhaps even more so where it'd be like 60 or 70% of what I say in that video will be from the text or from a commentary. We might get into the weird stuff with Newton or other figures, like some figures knew about Kavala. Newton actually apparently had a copy of the Zohar, which is like the fundamental text of Kabbalah that outlines and uses all of the Sefirot um, for the last 500 years. There were other movements in Kabbalah that predate it, but most modern Kabbalah talks about that. We might talk about the older stuff, which is less called Kabbalah and more called Secrets of the Bible. Um, Midrash. We will almost certainly dig into Midrash, which is basically like myths and legends about biblical characters. So if you ever wanted like I don't want to say it but I'll say it like fan fiction, not fan fiction, but you know, it's like myths or fairy tales about biblical figures. Like how um, Jacob used to walk across a river every day and it would part for him just like the Red Sea or the Dead Sea uh, or the Sea of Reeds, I believe is the literal translation, parted for uh, the children of Israel. So Israel himself, whom the children of Israel are named after, the Jewish people, right? Um, just that was an everyday occurrence for him. And so he was not impressed by miracles the way that perhaps we might be. Um, literature and literary criticism. I don't have an example of actual literature, but we might also get into literature. That is my degree. So we might talk about figures like William, bleh, William Wordsworth. I just finished War and Peace, which I have a giant edition of here. It is not, it's big, but it is not a difficult read at all. It's actually kind of easy to read, uh, extremely easy to read. Tolstoy was at a very, uh, very easy to understand, very comprehensible, not, not low and, and dumb, but um, like he wanted to be understood and he was, it's very almost conversational. War and Peace. Um, I don't necessarily recommend it unless you're a huge reader. Anna Karenina is much, it's a later work from him. It's much better written. His style is more refined and it's more engaging. And um, I think that's it. So I will be making another version of a video just like this with, if not a script, then a bullet point of everything I want to talk about and address in that video. And I'll be using the books again. And maybe I'll have a paragraph or two that I'll read from each book so that we get a sense of what exactly I want to uh, talk about. Um, let's do that. This one. The number seven is central to the covenant God made with Noah and his descendants, which is, you know, according to the myth of Noah or the story of Noah, were all his descendants, right? The covenant, known as the covenant of Noah. God assured Noah that he would never again destroy the world with water. The visible sign chosen by God to make mankind aware of this covenant was the rainbow. In Chassidut, it is explained that the flood actually had a purifying effect on the earth and its atmosphere, just as the waters of a ritual bath purify the one who immerses in them. Before the flood, the air was unrefined to the extent that a rainbow could not appear in it. The flood waters served to refine the air, allowing for the natural phenomenon of a rainbow to appear. So basically, 
perhaps it wasn't um, thick enough to hold water droplets suspended in the air that catch the light and turn into rainbows. How many colors are there in the rainbow? According to the Zohar, there are three. Three, isn't it seven? The Zohar says white, red, and yellow, green. Strange, isn't it? According to Isaac Newton, there are seven. Violet, indigo, blue, green, yellow, orange, and red. Notice how we've come full circle back to Newton. Newton is sort of our bridge. We'll probably be act as the bridge in our um, explorations from the scientific and rational to the um, super rational and religious. Here we cl clearly observe a three to seven relationship. The inner consciousness and experience of the divine soul, the context from which the Zohar relates, that conscious experience, consciousness experiences three colors in the rainbow. So you might say that some level of the spirit or soul sees a rainbow in only three colors, while the physical body sees it in seven colors. So the three colored rainbow, how can white be included as one of the colors? Physically, white does not appear in the rainbow at all. In color theory, the sensation of white is either a result of a color wheel spinning at high speed or the effect of an object reflecting at once all the colors present in the spectrum of a ray of light hitting it. As we will see, the question of whether white can be treated as a color can only be answered in lieu of the difference between the divine soul and the physical soul and the way it, we, in which each experiences the rainbow. Fascinating to me anyway. Um, so, you know, that's a little bit technical. What's interesting is he attaches each of these uh, colors to a personal attribute. So spiritual red is associated with understanding. The spiritual yellow green is associated with knowledge. Spiritual white with wisdom. Physical red is associated with might or uh, self-restraint, which is true strength, is strength applied to yourself and self-control. Loving kindness is associated with blue. Yellow gives us beauty. Um, acknowledgement is orange. Uh, victory or persistence is violet. Foundation is green. And uh, kingship or kingdom is indigo. And so, um, and here we see these ideas sort of superimposed in order on the, the bottom seven slots of the spherot. So then he correlates them with the seven laws given to Noah and all mankind. So now we have colors and attributes associated with them. For example, might, prohibition against murder. Self-controlling, self-control helps us to not murder or at a lower level harm other people. Loving kindness. Love expressed properly helps us avoid things like sexual immorality, like adultery, which is basically cheating, but with it's a little more severe. Beauty, harmony, has to do with the prohibition against theft. And so there's this idea that, and we'll close on this, if everybody stopped stealing then there would be world peace. Because what is war? Uh, in most cases, it's simply one territory trying to take either another territory or another group of people's resources. That's If it's not theft, it's related to theft at a sort of um, national level. So, like I promised, we will close here. Thanks for watching. Um, I will talk a little bit more after the end of this video, um, but I hope to see you next time and expect another video like this that's more like 5 or 10 or maybe 15 minutes long um, later. So I hope to see you next time.
you stuck around well terrific i want to talk about my setup i was using a kind of crappy webcam before but now i figured out how to use my phone as a webcam and we're doing that and that's turning out really terrific um i have a very nice mic now i have a samsung galaxy note 9 as my webcam and you can see what i love about it is that um you get this blur in the back which looks very professional if i get really close to the camera which is kind of like creepy and you can see the tiredness in my eyes oops i don't want to do that but it gets really blurry back there um so you know that's that's considered a very professional um very uh it just looks good right i think if i want to get it even more blurry i have to either apply a filter which looks bad and i probably won't do or i have to buy a better camera which i might do in the future um that's all this should be vlog 134 yeah vlog 134 thanks for watching i gotta get ready to go.